finals, so make sure to t stay tuned for that as well. Is it the Paul Pierce trade? They're in Brooklyn was... now. Oh. They're not. Jeez. That's a different place. Jeez, I'm that's sorry. also not uh, the same thing. I'm sorry. <laughs> You take New Jersey very seriously. I do. We're all very defensive. <laughs> you see Brad, our overall one seed, taking a mulligan to start off the match. He'll be on the play for every elimination round that he's playing. Yes. Having the number one seed is a big deal. And I know, you know, one of the things that's kind of cool too moving forward because of the seeding is, you know, being on the play is so powerful. And I know that you, you spoke about the fact that, you know, watching the tables just draw at the end of the last round is kind of an annoying or whatever um, to kind of lock their berth. Seeing people actually have to play it out to make top eight is just more exciting to watch. Um, but also, you know, there's a there's a benefit from actually playing out those matches where, you know, you would like to just draw and make top eight. That's absolutely fantastic. But having the one seed and being on the play all the way throughout in standard is a huge deal. Listen, the more matches near the top tables that are getting played as the tournament ends, the better it is for everyone. Except maybe for the people who would the one person who would have drawn and now can't because their opponent wants better seating. Yeah. Maybe a little worse for that person. Yeah. But for us covering the event, for the people in the tournament hall watching, and for everyone watching at home, it is better for those matches to be played out. Whatever incentives you can give to have people actually playing out the last rounds of the tournament, I think makes the experience better for everyone. So Nelson's going to lay out six cards here. Let's see if he can find a better six. Is he happy? Is he sad? Coming through, he doesn't look terribly pleased. Reaching for the deck. All right. All right, good enough. Quarterfinals underway. Turn one Temple Garden from Brad. The Steam Vents from Costa. So Nelson's gonna play Galish right on tap. First blood here, gonna push himself down to 18. And it is time for a Skirt Stack High Priest. A card that I don't think plays a huge role in this matchup, but you know, the threat of pushing out a 5-5 demon is a little bit scary, and it looks like Koss is actually going to have to tap out this turn and play an Augur Volus. So we could see Brad do something, and he's done a lot over the course of playing this deck, which is a Cartel Risk Rat into a Doom Traveler and pump out a 5-5 token. Yeah, it's, it's an unlikely sequence, and Matt's deck has a number of ways to fend that draw off, but he is exposed right now, so we'll see if Brad has the necessary follow-up to get this High Priest online right now. Nelson's going to play a Sun Petal Grove. It looks like he's going to play a Lingering Souls. That he is. So if you're Costa, you know, you're probably happy about that, getting out alive with no 5-5 five, five token. But at the same time, Lingering Souls can be a bit of an annoyance. Yeah, no, I mean, on one hand, Matt is breathing a sigh of relief that nothing too terrible happened. On the other side, game one Lingering Souls, pretty powerful against Matt. Again, no Thunder Maw Hellkites in the main, only in the sideboard. And so Lingering Souls is going to be somewhat annoying for him to slog through. Yeah. You see Costa this turn draws a pillar of flame. Very slow for his action. Does, has not even played a land yet. Trying to figure out what he wants to do. Do I just want to use the pillar of flame to take out this high priest? Save it for later. Plenty of options here. It's Costa's way. And you know most likely he's going to make the correct one. Yeah, there is almost certainly this turn is going to start off with the high priest being killed. It's just an issue if he wants to do it through turn burn or through pillar of flame. He selects turn burn. And I think the reason you see that is just because of the presence of Voice of Resurgence. That and combined with the mana efficiency. Yeah. Turn burn, not at its best against Brad. He doesn't really have a, a number of huge threats. Really only a single Obsidat is where the Fuse would come into play. And so Matt doesn't want to get too greedy here and just uses more expensive spells. So Nelson's going to start his turn by coming across for two. He's drawing another Lingering Souls for the turn. The other card that he has in his hand that I think he would have loved to not have to reveal this turn as far as the land drop is concerned is a Gavney Township. Yes. I think he would have loved to have drawn a different land for this turn to have a fourth land be something else and then fifth land be Gavney Township. Yeah, the, the less information you can provide cost to the better. Now, and this is going to sound, you know, I was, this may sound a little bit ludicrous, but I think Brad was almost considering not playing his land because he just did not want to give away that information because it's so relevant to kind of what he's setting up here as a surprise way to deal in between four to six points of damage. Yeah. But the upside, obviously, of drawing the fifth land there is so high that Brad is going to make his land drop and play another Lingering Souls. Costa a bit under the gun here. Like we've said, not that well set up to fight over Lingering Souls in game one. 
Burger of Bolas. Gonna be turned sideways. Costa plays a Glacial Fortress. See if he has that one Supreme Verdict in his hand, potentially. He does not. So he just has to pass the turn back. You see Restoration Angel. You see Rewind in his hand. So he is gonna have some turn four action. We're just gonna see what it's gonna be. Yep. And Brad has just drawn his fifth land. So now Gammy Township at the ready. If he so chooses. Brad with only one black source of mana in play. So he can't elect to flash back both the Lingering Souls this turn. He can flash back one, but... The big question here, if you're Costa, with that Rewind in your hand, because it can lead to a big turn of Rewind and then Restoration Angel, is what's worth Rewinding? Is anything worth Rewinding right now? I have to believe that... Cartel Aristocrat, probably not, because he has an Augur on defense, but I believe a flashback of Lingering Souls is close. All right, so we are going to defer to Matt's judgment here. Just happy to rewind anything. Because you don't want that thing clogging your hand, and Cartel Aristocrat is, I feel like it's right on the edge of, of being countered, just because I know watching Brad play this, I know watching Brad play this, um, he plays Cartel Aristocrat very aggressively to yeah. force through damage. I think that Cartel Aristocrat is probably not necessary to counter if Gavity Township is not a thing, but that combination has the potential to take the game over. Sure. Especially with Brad having access to so many expendable Lingering Souls tokens. And Rewind is kind of the card I think that this turn Brad didn't want to see. I think he wanted to play, you know, Cartel Risk and bait out a counter spell to be able to push damage through the forces cost to tap mana on his turn and then he can keep on moving. If you see him gonna play a land and flashback Lingering Souls now, I think, you know, ideally in a perfect world he would love if that would have been like a syncopator or dissipate or something and not have to worry about Restoration Angel. And Restoration Angel isn't the end of the world here, but I don't, obviously you'd, you'd rather not lose a guy than yes. lose one. Right, especially with Gavney Township, Brad has a fair amount of in inevitability in play, so he doesn't want to throw away a token for little gain. And you see Nelson not attack here. Just plays the Lingering Souls tokens and then, and then moves on with his life. This play is going to be very interesting because he could have pushed through three, three points of damage, put Costa down to 15, and then, and then you know, he loses one of his spirits, but then he ends up having five. So is it smarter to try to go long against Costa, against a deck that you know has Sphinx's Revelation? Are you, do you, are you comfortable trying to go long against a deck like this, or should you just be trying to force through damage, and if you have to lose one of those spirits, big deal? I think with Gavany Township in play, there's pretty huge upside to building up your board and trying to win that way. So. I, I like Brad holding off. If Costa was a little bit lower, we maybe could have a different conversation. I also think the, the presence of Helix in Matt Costa's deck also means that the incremental points of damage he's doing can easily be undone. So if I were in Costa's position, I would rather pump the brakes, or in Brad's position rather, I would rather pump the brakes and just try to build up a board of Gavney Township and. Leverage all those spirits. So Costa just plays a Sacred Foundry, and again, organizing, figuring out what he wants to do. Very meticulous. Yep. Brad now debating if he wants to add to his border or if he just wants to sit on Gavney Township. So we see, think twice. Draws a Restoration Angel. Pretty good draw there. Yep. If you're Costa. Costa really needs to search for his one main deck copy of Supreme Verdict. He's got a lot of power left over in his hand. There's no shortage of tools to recover with, but yeah. that Gavney Township and those six Lingering Souls tokens threatening to make short work. We're going to use a pillar to knock out one. So there's your Township activation. Now the interesting thing here is, I, you know, because both players have access to each other's deck lists, I don't think you would ever, I, it's almost like you wouldn't see Brad play this way unless he knew that Costa only has one Supreme Verge in his deck. Mm -hmm. you know, I think he would be a little more aggressive forcing through damage, being wary of you know multiple Supreme Verdicts, multiple Terminus maybe looming, but he knows that Costa has one Master Removal spell in his deck. That's it. Yep. Makes for very, very interesting gameplay. Of course, you can't sit there, you know, you can't sit there forever. There is only one copy, but there's a lot of cantrips in the blue, white, red flash deck, there's Sphinx's Revelation, draw a bunch of cards, mm -hmm. Augur is looking at a bunch of things and, and moving dead cards to the bottom. And so even though there's one copy, the blue, white, red flash deck is way more equipped to find a singleton in its main deck than just about any other deck in the format. Yeah, agreed. 
So Nelson has a Blood Artist in his hand, still has that Gavney Township in play at the ready. Got two Two Spirit Tokens right now, but those are threatening to become 3-3s. Three and if he wants to take it, move all the way into the red zone, because again, you see him kind of waiting here, trying to figure out if Costa does have another Restoration Angel, which of course, you guys at home, as well as us, know that he does. So this is a this is scary times here for Nelson. Lingering Soul still in the graveyard, Blood Artist in hand. It really feels like to me that he doesn't want to, uh, it feels like he doesn't have any interest in playing that other Lingering Soul. I don't think he's really been given a reason to, would you agree? Not yet. I mean, adding one lingering, an additional lingering souls flashback to his board is not worth it. I think once he has enough man to do that and activate Gavin Township in the same turn, then you can start to talk about it. But it's certainly not worth his turn right now. He had so, he had so much more, you know, net pressure to the board. Simply activating Gavin Township at this point. So it looks like he's putting a card forward. Now, if he wants to play both Blood Artist and Lingering Soul in the same turn, or hmm. perhaps Garrick. So Garrick Relentless is going to be Nelson's play this turn. You see him reorganize his mana. So the Planeswalker is what he's going to start with. Now, this is very interesting, playing this pre-combat. Maybe he wants to attempt to fight the Augur Volus and, and, and get the Restoration Angel out of Costa's hand. Maybe he just wants to make a Wolf Token and then be able to keep pumping those out? Well, in any case, it allows him to advance his board without playing further into Supreme Burger. So that's, sure. if nothing else, that's a good foundation mm -hmm. to start his turn. The fact that he can also find a little bit more information about the presence of Restoration Angel in Matt Costa's hand, also valuable, because if Costa doesn't have it, it could be worth it to attack with everything this turn. If Costa has a second Restoration Angel, that's probably the tipping point where it's no longer efficient for Brad to be attacking with the Spirits. Mm -hmm. So, That second Restoration Angel, it changes so much right. in what's going on in the game and for what Brad's trying to craft this situation where I don't know if, he, if his goal is to make it so that those, those Spirit Tokens are 4-4s. Four Maybe he's happy with them being just three power guys, but I obviously not because he played a Garrick here, but I agree with you that it does give him some very nice Supreme Verdict protection. And based on the fact that we haven't put a die on this Garrick and the expression on Costa's face, I believe he's contemplating potentially countering this Garrick. Yeah, he does have a counterflux in his hand, and, and I'm with you, where you know Costa is not sure if he wants to use this or not. And and if you guys remember one thing too. Costa plays in such a way with these flash decks where he really tries to reel people in. And really trick him, which is which is a good thing. Yeah. Obviously, if he thinks that long about countering it and doesn't and doesn't counter it, and then can and then can really ruin Brad with the Restoration Angel, it changes everything. Yep. So you see Brad now with a no threat of a second Restoration Angel, send his five spirits across the table. Matt blocks one and takes eight, falling to ten. So Costa for his turn gonna attack with Augur Volos immediately to start things. Draws a think twice for the turn. So again, let's see what he wants to start this turn. Does he want to try to cantrip and hit a, and hit a sixth land? Or does he just want to leave all this mana up and again put Nelson to the test? Yeah, and we, we're sort of a you know overlooking those these Augur Bolas attacks. And you see Matt, Snapcaster, and Pillar, the spirit token. But Blue White Red Flash is actually capable of kind of winning out of nowhere, and these points that are adding up from Augur Bolas actually might make the difference between Matt being able to flash into Restoration Angel and use a Helix and attack for Zach uh -huh. Lethal. So don't lose sight of the fact that, that Brad's going to 14, he's taking some hits here from these Augurs. They're actually an important part of Matt's overall plan to this matchup. Brad again attacks all the spirits. You see a Gavney Township activation that's going to push across three, six, eight, ten points of damage on board. So this in requires a response. Wow, that's a big play there. So what ends up happening there is Costa uses Zorius Charm to put a Spirit back on top. Restoration Angel gets in front of one of those 3-3 three, three tokens. Restoration Angel being a 3-4, but Nelson casts Tragic Stuff to make it a 2-3, so his Spirit wins in combat. Costa for the turn draws an Augur of Volos. 
but now Costa is sitting at three life. That was a big tragic slip. Yeah, I actually am a, a little curious about it because it feels like, because Costa is almost certainly supreme verdict or bust, regardless of whether or not that Restoration Angel is in play, I, I'm a little dubious about whether or not you would want to clear it out there, but obviously he's puts puts Costa to the test. There's no other sequence of cards you can have at this point mm -hmm. to get out of this bind. It's got to be, it's got to be Supreme Verdict. And Costa's just trying to see if there's any way. Think twice to draw a card. Sulfur Falls is his draw. You don't see it often, but it looks like a little frustration here from Costa. Maybe he doesn't like the way that he sequenced this game. You see Nelson draws another Lingering Souls gonna come sideways here and Costa is going to concede the game. So Brad Nelson does win game number one over Matthew Costa. Junk Aristocrats up a game over Blue White Red Flash. And, and like we mentioned before, Costa obviously with the Thunderball Hellkites has a lot more game against Lingering Souls in, in games two and three, but game one, one of Brad's best tools and a couple copies of Lingering Souls plus Gavney Township easily allowing Brad to overcome his mulligan. So step one, we're going to take a look at the sideboards here. We're going to begin with Matthew Costa's sideboard, as he will be on the play for this game. The card we've talked about at length this weekend, and a card I would be very surprised to see him not sideboard in. Thundermall Hellkite times three. He has won numerous games. He, he basically attributes this to him being, make it, being able excuse me, to make top eight this weekend. Three of those likely to come in. You see three copies of Dispel. Not so much for this matchup. A clone, a pillar of flame, I think, is going to come in. An oblivion ring, the potential for that to come in. A big heavy hitter in Supreme Verdict, which he was trying to hit that entire game. Cer certainly wouldn't hurt to have another copy of that. And then some interesting cards. Uh, three copies of Renounce the Guilds. I don't think they're great here, but there are cards that they do kill in Nelson's deck. In Cartel Aristocrat, in Varls, and in Voice of Resurgence. Including Obsidat, and potentially the second Obsidat that Brad could be bringing in as well. Not a ton of threats, but all of them very durable. Yes. And so having a good answer card to those may be worth considering. You know, he does have three of those. Doesn't mean he have to board, doesn't mean he has to board in all three, but he has access to three of those if he'd like them. And then the other one, which I think is going to come in here, is two copies of Visit Static Caster. That can, of course, control Lingering Souls, but it can actually shoot down two power creatures as well. One if he draws both of them, but two in combination with Restoration Angel. You can get a lot of value of it that way. And also one thing to not ignore is that that being an O3 body lines up pretty well against a card like Voice of Resurgence until he draws a pillar. A legitimate blocker and, like you said, a lot of token action going on in Brad's deck, a lot of one toughness creatures. Another good answer to Lingering Souls, which we saw dominate the first game. Mm -hmm. So we take a look at Nelson's sideboard here. You see three Abrupt Decay, two Duress, a Sin Collector, four Deathrite Shaman, and that additional Obsidat, Ghost Council, two Appetite for Brains, and two copies of Smite. What stands out to you here? Well, certainly the cards that are good against spells in general, most notably the two Duresses and the Sin Collector. I suspect that Obsidat you basically want in any game that's not going to go extremely short. And in general, post-board games just People are bringing in more answer cards and less threat cards. That's generally how sideboarding works. And so Obsidat is more powerful when the game's going to be slower, obviously. You have more time to get to your mana and to let it let it do its thing. I would anticipate the second copy coming in. The question mark to me is the two copies of Appetite for Brains. Costa has not that many fours, but they are very impactful in the matchup, especially Restoration Angel and Thundermaw Hellkite, which we've mentioned a couple of times. I suspect they are not coming in because there's just so few targets overall in Costa's deck, but it's worth considering because the things it can get are very high impact. Another question mark to me is four copies of Deathrite Shaman. I believe they're for more dedicated, you know, junk reanimator matchups. It's possible you want them against things like Red Green Beatdown because you can use it to gain life after you've used spot removal to kill their creatures. Costa does do a lot of interaction with the graveyard, most notably Snapcaster Mage. He also has a couple copies of Moreland Haunt, and so that's also not out of the question. I think that the two duresses, the one Sin Collector, and the one copy of Obsidat are all almost certainly coming in. And then I think there's merits to bring in potentially Appetite, Death Red Shaman, um, and yeah, Appetite and the four Death Red Shamans. Now, Death Red Shaman is a card that every time Brad has played this deck and you talk to him about him, you talk with him, excuse me, about this deck a lot, you know, again, putting this deck on the map at SCG Baltimore and winning there. Talking with him over the past couple of weeks, he's always tried to skimp on the number of Deathrite Shamans that he can play, and coming in this week, he said, you know what, I'm done doing that. 
I'm done trying to do that. Every time I, I chop one or two death by shamans from my sideboard, I immediately regret it. I know in SCG Columbus, he cut all of them, and then he ended up playing a Junk Reanimator, and he's like, yeah, I don't know what I'm doing cutting this card. And he said, you know, it comes in in multiple other matchups too. And again, I don't have to board in all four of them. In Junk Reanimator, I want all four. But in other matchups, I don't want all four, but I want access to this card because it does so many different things. And just being able to blank Snapcaster Major and cost this case, where you see he has copies of Think Twice, being able to remove that as well is pretty potent. Yeah, and Death Ray Shaman is another card that, in general, just gets more powerful when the game is slowed down. Mm -hmm. When you have an opportunity to use removal spells, when the game is going to be going on long in general, the life gain, the ability to burn out Costa with its with the removing instants and sorceries, on top of all the work it can do against Death Rite Shaman and flashback spells and Morlin Haunt, the total package of it may be worth bringing in here, even though it's not a card you would normally associate with being an anti blue white red flash card. I mean, there's always some cards here in Nelson's in Nelson's deck that just aren't great or probably aren't of the power level of Deathrite Shaman. Of course, Doom Traveler and Young Wolf are all contextual in this deck. They work very well here. But, you know, is that the kind of card you want after sideboard where you know Cost is going to get access to another Pillar of Flame? Um, you know, that's a very real thing that's going to be taking place. But, you know, you, you can board out those kind of mediocre one-drops and board into a card that is as powerful as Deathrite Shaman. Yeah, and I think... Brad needs to cite out some of the tools that make this deck so powerful at fighting on the ground because that's not Costa's game plan at all. So whether or not that's removing a couple of copies of the wolf like you mentioned, maybe High Priest is inappropriate given the amount of easy removal yeah. that Matt has for it, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. Some of those pieces that make this deck line up so well against Naya and Jun, the more ground and pound oriented decks, I think Brad should de-emphasize some of those tools and bring in good hand disruption and additional quality threats. So it'll be fun to watch which way these players do go for sideboarding here as they are presenting their decks over to each other. Game number two will be underway shortly. Costa will be on the play as these two juggernauts do battle. Brad very, very happy with his deck this weekend, he said. You know, obviously he's been playing Junk Aristocrats for a while and has had success with it, but he said, this is the build that I have liked the most. Mm -hmm. of all the ones that I have worked on. And as we have said m many times over the course of this week, and that this format was one where you play the decks that you know more than anything. And uh, before we kick off the second game, remember, of course, again, right before the finals, we have a large, important announcement to make regarding the Invitational New Jersey coming up in three weeks, so make sure to stay tuned for that as well. Costa contemplating his seven cards. Decides to keep, and as, as does Brad. This feels like a matchup to me where it's a lot less important to be on the play or on the draw, and more important to have the quality cards, the cards I, that matter in the matchup. Yeah, I think the games are going to go long always, like no matter what. Nelson's deck doesn't put on that fast of a clock. Again, it's all it's this deck that's full of resistant threats, and then Costa's deck wants the game to go long in the first place, and he wants to do whatever it takes to make that happen. Do you see a duress here is going to take Sphinx's Revelation, at least Costa with a lot of lands and one renounce the guilds. So. You can Draw see steps why, are going to be important. You can see why Costa mulled over sending that hand back. I think in game one, that's a no question keep, but knowing that Brad is signing into some hand disruption makes that hand a lot sketchier, and he got punished with Brad's opening duress. Well, it looks like his first two draw steps are doing okay. As Costa's going to play a softer pulse, he's going to pillar of flame, voice resurgence, and move right along here, representing currently Renounce the Guilds, but we know that he also has Think Twice at the ready here as Nelson is going to tap a little mana and it's going to be a death right shaman so he has brought at least one in going to play temple garden untapped and now here's a cartel aristocrat the way that nelson sequenced these plays he knows that costa has renounced the guilds and he's basically saying i would rather you kill my death right shaman with renounce instead of cartel aristocrat yes So that's exactly what's going to happen. Renounce the Guilds takes care of Deathrite. Cartel going to stay in play as Costa draws a Snapcaster Mage. So keeping this land heavy hand is working out just fine thus far. Yeah, his draw steps have been excellent so far. He's. Let's see if we find a pillar to get rid of the Aristocrat. Still has Think Twice in his hand, too. We can reload. Mm -hmm. Doing pretty well. As we do have an update for you guys in another match, our five versus four seed. Reed Duke was our five, and he's moving on. He wins 2-0 over Sammy T, so he'll be playing the winner of this match here in Brad Nelson and Matthew Costa. Congratulations to Reed. Let's see. 
and then a land off the top. Cost his hand now, I think, twice in two lands. So let's find a new card, Azorius Charm. Not a bad place to start. Going to play a Clifftop Retreat and just pass the turn back. Cam threatened the flashback on the Think Twice as Nelson, a little bit bottlenecked on mana. Not the first time we've seen this from him this weekend. Mm -hmm. Sitting on the hand of Verils, Obsidat, Garrick Relentless. He's obviously, lands are huge draws for him going forward. He's got a lot of powerful action. You can see Costa pick up a Sphinx's Revelation. Got a land here. Maybe we'll see a Revelate for three here on, on uh, Nelson's end step. Not quite sure. You see him move the lands over. Again, does have a Zorius charm as well. So if Nelson does try to load up on something here with Verls, Costa can undo that very quickly as Nelson draws a duress for the turn. And that, One heck of a draw stop. And that tap steam vents a pretty loud indicator from Costa that he was not planning on Revelating uh -huh. this turn. This duress might change that. You know, if that's an untapped land, you see a little bit of frustration because now he has to revelate for two, where I'm pretty sure he'd be much happier revelating for three. Yeah. So hit one and hit two. Thundermaw Hellkite the draw there. That's huge, but it also gives Brad the information that now I can't flashback Lingering Souls. Yes. A lot of, a lot of information to work with here, but Thundermaw very, I'm sure Matt is more than happy to have Thundermaw Hellkite even if Brad is aware of its presence. Oh, yeah. Nelson's going to put that duress in the graveyard. You see him reaching for mana. Does have a Doom Traveler in his hand. But he's going to start by Verals. I'm going to remove Deathrite Shaman. Going to pump up the jam here. And very important for Brad to get some of his tokens up to beyond 1 1 so they can mm -hmm. survive this Thunder Maw. So now Verals and Spirit tokens are coming across here. Costa considering blocking with Snapcaster Mage, but it's just going to take the damage. going to take 5 move down to 15. Yeah, the problem with the block on Verals there is that Brad can simply sacrifice the 1-1 one, one Spirit to regenerate that's going to die to this Thunder Maw anyway. So you're better off waiting to block next turn where it's a higher opportunity cost for for uh, for Brad to make that attack with Verals. And if 2 is good, 3 is better as Costa draws his third and final Sphinx's Revelation for the game. You see him organize his lands here for Thunderball Hellkite, figuring, do I want to pull the trigger on this right now? I'm only going to get one Spirit token with this, and if I play it, am I going to attack with it? Is it going to be on defense? What do I want to do? I think that's the decision-making process that he is currently going through right now. So he's going to add... Looks like he's going to play his Thunderball and trigger it. Brad going to regenerate Verals, never missing anything, and he's reaching for both. Wow, wow, okay. Sides against and sends only Thundermaw. Only, in quotes, a 5-5 five, five <laughs> yeah. flyer. Bear with me. <laughs> As Nelson draws a Godless Shrine for the turn, you see his hand. He has Garrick Relentless. He's also got Obsidian over there, but he has another land. And don't forget about that Lingering Souls in the graveyard either. Now the coast may be clear for that. And a lot of the complexity from Brad's side right now is playing this Godless Shrine untapped. Drops him from 11 to 9. That turns Thunderball Hellkite into a two-turn clock. Mm -hmm. So that's a very significant change in life. So now Garrick is going to fight Snapcaster Mage. You see Nelson's going to turn those guys sideways, and he's going to leave that Spirit Token back right now. So, Cost is going to untap here. He draws a card. It's a Hollowed Fountain to go along with that Island and Sphinx's Revelation in his hand. So is he still going to be offensive with that Thunderbolt Hellkite, or is he going to get a little bit more defensive? I think he's happy to, because he now has a big Revelate in his hand, I think he's happy to play a damage racing game and basically compel Brad to attack back. Mm -hmm. This Revelate's going to be a gigantic s shift in the tempo of the game. Yeah, it's going to be a revelation for five. It's going to give Costa five life, but more importantly, it's going to give him five new cards here. I want to see how Brad's going to be using this Garrick the Veil Curse. So it looks like it's going up. Going to give him a Death Touch Wolf token. But I think if you're Costa there, you're pretty happy about that because that means he's not tutoring through his deck to find a very scary creature. Well, the, the, the problem is that Brad already has it in, in his fifth land in Ops of that. So in with Verils and Doom Traveler yet again. And Brad plays his land in Isolated Chapel and slams down Obzidak Ghost Council. So Brad now going. all the cards are on the table. Oh, Brad's cards are on the table. Yes, because Costa's going to refill here with five new ones. 
there goes Obzad in exile for now. But for Costa, very, very important as he does get to revelate for five, find himself five new cards. And for hopefully for him, five new options as he quickly untaps one of those cards, Patrick, being another Thunderwall Hellkite. Yep. It's very possible that uh, Matt actually has the tools to finish him off this turn. It would not be unreasonable. Restoration Angel, the draw for the turn as well. You see that because of that Obzadak coming into play, it put Nelson up to 11 out of range from a double Thunder Maul play. Now, of course, there is the onboard trick there with Vorals sacrificing a Doom Traveler to put a flying blocker in the way. One thing that Nelson will not miss. Yes. Curious to see how Matt wants to sequence the spells here. And the play of Hobble Fountain untapped, put himself down to 10. Four and five. Looks like we're going to Dragon Town. So Thunderball Hellkite. Going out to trigger. Coming in with both. Sacrifice here. Will Nelson for a Doom Traveler. Costa immediately. Is it Static Caster that to shoot that flyer out of the sky? And you can see a pillar of flame in his hand going yeah. upstairs, and that means we're moving to game number three. Yeah. And that, that Thunder Maw, you know, that's a, that represents a big shift in the matchup. It increases the speed with which Costa can actually win the game and does so much work against Lingering Souls. Yeah. And you saw both elements on display there. An incredible, incredible card in his deck, a fantastic sideboarding strategy. As he has said numerous times this weekend talking with them. You see him taking a bit of a sigh of relief there, getting out of that game alive after that, that opening hand and being duressed. We've seen him multiple times this weekend say that, hey, Thunderball Hellkite is a place that I wanted to be in my sideboard. He recognizes the power of the card. A lot of people are trying to get it into the main deck, but it lets him shift what he wants to do in the sideboard of games. As you said, a lot of sideboard of games go long because people are bringing in answers. And this is not a reactive answer. This is a proactive card that changes the way that the opponent has to play the game. And a lot of the time, people are going to sideboard in such a way that they don't have an answer for this card. And it's especially meaningful because most of the ways that people are typically going to try to fight blue, white, red flash are either going to be with duress effects mm -hmm. or things that attack the graveyard yep. to try to shut up, snap, cast a mage, think twice, moorland hot, and so on. Having a card that ignores both of those angles of attack is independently powerful and shores up some of the types of cards you're weak against makes it pretty much the perfect sideboard card to go to. Mm -hmm. I'm sure he caught a lot of people off guard all weekend long. Of course, Nelson does have access to the deck list, but, you know, one thing that's kind of scary is that having access and knowing he's going to board in front of my Hulk, nothing you can do about it. Yeah. You have to kind of hope he doesn't really run into it in a timely situation. And that second, excuse me, that third revelation, that large revelation was able to find him another one, and almost a perfect revelation there is as he was able to untap and end the game immediately. Yeah, it's... And Brad's in somewhat in an awkward spot in these post-board games because his deck is sort of set up to play a longer sort of attrition -y game. He has additional hand disruption to sort of further that plan, but Mad Sec is both capable of killing very quickly, not giving Brad, contextually killing very quickly, sure. not giving Brad that much time to set up all of his different synergies and, and, and whatnot, and also has Sphinx's Revelation. So you can't let the game go on forever, and you also have to be cautious of how much damage you're taking early on in the game. So. Brad is kind of in between a rock and a hard place, in my opinion, in the way that these games play out post-board. You know, one thing that we've talked about a lot when we watch Costa play, and also his friend Chase Kovac, we had him in a feature match a little bit earlier today as well, both playing the same 75, is that one thing that's happened every time we've watched them play is their ability to turn the corner so fast. You know, when I think about turning the corner, the one deck that did that very well from years past was Blue Black Furies around Laura one time. That deck would play a little bit of defense via Cryptic Command, Bitter Blossom, Chump Blocking here, countering a spell there, and then Mistbind Click and Scion of Una would allow that deck to turn the corner at a frightening pace. Mutable included as well. And Thunderball Hellkite allows Costa to do that here, in which, you know, he's you know, take a look at that game, for example. You know, Pillar Flame, Snapcaster Major, announce the gills, kill a couple of your creatures, stabilizing the board. Brad, yes, you have a very nice board presence. And two turns later, eh, I've got the W. Yeah. Thunderbolt Hellkite allows for that kind of play and just being just to turn on a dime. Yeah, and I really like the way that Thunderbolt Hellkite and Sphinx's Revelation play with each other because, you know, I've, I've made this comment before about Blue White Red Flash often because you have so many low impact cards in the deck, your Revelations don't necessarily bury someone in the same way they do when you're playing Bant or Esper. Thunderbolt Hellkite gives you a, a high impact card to draw off of your Revelations. Mm -hmm. 
A lot of good cards in cost effect, a lot of good cards to draw to, and that third revelation was an absolute backbreaker. To be fair, that duress that Brad drew off the top for the second one was huge too. So a lot of back and forth here, some timely draw steps from two incredibly good Magic players. And isn't it fitting that we're going to play a third and final game here? It seems yeah. only right. Right, and Costa's draws, not even just the, the mid-game, the more dramatic top decks of Duress and Sphinx's Revelation. His draw steps from turns two to four, after getting Duress and having renounced the guilds and land in hand, was about as good as you could ask for. I think a Think Twice and a Renounce and a Snapcaster Mage and a Pillar were all involved. Mm -hmm. And given what Brad was up to, that was pretty much the perfect sequence of, of draws. And that gave Nat the appropriate velocity and breathing space to start deploying some of his more powerful cards. It's, so, it's easy to sometimes only look at the haymakers, but often it's the subtle top decks in the earlier turns that sculpt a lot of the pace of play. Absolutely. I mean, even the even the little interaction there with, uh, with Isn't Static Cast from the final turn of the game might seem subtle, but I don't think that Costa has any interest in playing another turn that game. You know, he wants to get that game over with that turn um, so that Nelson can't get his Ozidat back, you have to worry about a draw step, something like a Gavany Township, or another spell. It's, it's very nice, you know, Static Caster is not going to be at the forefront of Brad's mind of losing that game, it's just kind of a piece of the puzzle. Yeah. You know, Ozidat comes back, you can sack the barrels to scaven on something and possibly have some enormous turn out of nowhere. So we do have another update very quickly here as both players are taking a look at their opening hand. Josh McLean of Team Mana Deprived wins his match two games to zero over Christopher Larson, so Junk Reanimator is going to be moving on to the semifinals as well. See Nelson start off with a Temple Guard and a Woodland Cemetery into Cartel Riscret. Costa, also with all of his colors of mana, has a pillar to take care of the Aristocrat. And you see that Nelson led off with that instead of a Voice of Resurgence, probably willingly as he's going to play an Appetite for Brains. Costa going to fan his hand out. You see Pillar of Flame, you see Think Twice, and you see a bunch of lands yet again. So this Appetite for Brains is going to miss. You see Nelson going to write all of the cards down work with the best information excuse me, that he can moving forward. But the point I was going to make is that you saw him lead out with a Cartel Risk Ride instead of Voice of Resurgence, probably trying to bait out a Pillar of Flame, yeah. which worked, except for there's a backup one. Right, I think it's, it's if he's already committed to Appetiting on turn three, then you get to see if the coast is clear, and you don't particularly care that much if you trade a Cartel Aristocrat with a Pillar. If it's Voice, that's, a, that's devastating. So he works with more complete information. So this was the gambit I was talking about a little bit with Appetite for Brains. Not a lot in the way of targets. A lot of them are high impact though, so maybe worth bringing in. And Brad, Appetites, and there's nothing to speak of in there. Yeah, there's definitely a cost to that, right? I mean, Appetite can be absolutely fantastic. It, it exiling a card is huge too, instead of putting it into the graveyard. But he completely missed. And now, you know, look, look at how long it's taken for just to figure out what he wants to do, how he wants to pace this game moving forward. I think now that he knows about the second pillar, what he's contemplating is playing nothing this turn and trying to play two spells in a subsequent turn because he doesn't want Matt to basically curve into his removal. Mm -hmm. He may just be willing to play Cartel Aristocrat here because, again, it's not the end of the world to trade this with a pillar, but... Oh boy, Restoration Angel the draw here for Costa, a card that Nelson does not know about, so there is your Pillar of Flame. And Costa's going to be able to mask this Restoration Angel so very well on the next turn after. He's likely going to cast a Think twice this turn, and then be able to mask Restoration Angel the following turn with four mana, thinking I'm just going to flashback Think twice. So you see Nelson's going to play a Voice of Resurgence. Costa going to smartly respond by yeah. casting Think twice and just pass the turn back. Matt has a lot of early velocity in this game under very little pressure from Nelson. See, Costa's going to play a Cavern of Souls. We'll get the name on that here in just a moment. He's just going to cast an Angel main face here just to be a blocker for that Voice of Resurgence. Again, for those of you a little less familiar with maybe some of the newer cards of Dragon of the Maids, main facing that Restoration Angel to avoid a Voice of Resurgence trigger. No elemental token here for Nelson, as you see his hand of Sun Petal Grove, Gavany Township, and Veral's the Scar Strike. A little bit of difficulty here for him right now, not able to find a, a you know high impact card like a Lingering Souls, like an Obsidat. Does have Gavany Township, so he can make his creatures larger, but he needs some more creatures right now to be able to make that card more relevant. And don't overlook how those Pillar Flames have removed those Cartel Aristocrats from the game. It's really minimizing a lot of the impact that barrels could have in this spot. We could start scavenging potentially onto our voice resurgence otherwise. Yeah, and pushing through damage yeah. very easily. 
Instead, Brad, with a handful of pretty anemic tutus in the Gavney Township to try to work with here. Uh, it's, a, it's a shame, right, that, uh, that the old cartel risk can't, sac can't sacrifice itself. It can only sacrifice another creature, because I think Brad would gladly sacrifice itself in response to Philip for just that reason that you mentioned with Verils. So now Nelson is going to cast said Verils. And now the question, and we have seen this before, it almost feels like he doesn't want to give up the information that he has at Gavney Township. Again, he has Sun Petal Grove Gavney Township. That's his hand. But, I mean, he's taking his time here. He doesn't want to mask that, hey, I have nothing right now. Yeah, it's possible that he also just wants to bluff that he has spells in hand and not land. So even playing the Sun Petal Grove gives him very little value. You mm -hmm. can still activate the Gavney Township the same way the next turn, but you at least cause Mad to consider more spells that you could potentially have. Also, intentionally missing a land drop here very strongly represents Obs of that potentially being in your hand as well. Yes. That can influence Matt's plays. So will Nelson play a land here? I love, love, love just trying to get every edge here. They've just thinking so long about playing a land here is so huge to me. And I think the reason ultimately that Brad decided to play a land here is because next turn he has Duress in his deck, he has Doom Traveler, and if he misses his land drop, he can't activate Township and play a potential one mana spell mm -hmm. at the top. So Brad is going to sacrifice his voice token. He's going to get an elemental, and now he's going to scavenge it onto Veril to make that a 4 4 regenerating creature. So he wants to have a big body out there. The elemental token is going to be a 2 2 right now, but Gavin Township will make that a 3 3 moving forward. and. And if Nelson draws any creatures like the Lingering Souls, make that a 4 4. So, this is a calculated risk here by him. Yes. Flashback, think twice to start the turn for Costa. Draws another thing twice. You see his hand again, a lot of lands there as he plays a Glacial Fortress. He's going to pass the turn back and leave his Restoration Angel on defense. Nelson draws a Godless Shrine. Going to play that Gavney Township now. And in comes the 4 4 Verls. And looks like we're going to make it a 5 5. So a very difficult regenerating threat here. As you see, Koss is going to cast a thing twice end of turn. Again, Voice Resurgence is not there to stop him from doing that. There is a Snapcaster Mage drawn for the turn, but not very good targets in the graveyard. Yeah, we've we've lost our opportunity to flashback Pillar on to the Elemental Token, as it's now a 3-3. Now, one thing that he can do moving forward, though, you see he needs it. It, what Costa feels like he's doing right now is he's just trying to set up some sort of revelation. Maybe it's going to be a baby revelation, but it looks like he's going to start with a think twice, get himself a card, a steam vent, so a lot of lands here for Costa right now. Yep. And next turn, with that elemental token going up to a 4-4, Brad's going to be able to significantly increase the, increase the amount of pressure he has. Yep. It will change the way that Matt has to play this game moving forward. I think Brad knew that, setting up a couple turns in advance. Doom Traveler the draw, and that is a very, very good one allows Brad to both add to his board, grow his elemental, and still activate Gavany Township. And that's a resilient card too, because it also gives him something beautiful to sacrifice to Verils. As far as draws go, that may have been one of the best yeah. ones in his deck. A lot of subtle interactions on display with the Junk Aristocrats deck right now. Now one card I was thinking of right now, Patrick, I was considering the ramifications of what happens if Costa finds his way to a renounce the guilds and that almost might be his best draw here because of that snapcaster mage that he drew previously that elemental token is both green and white yeah and Verl's being multicolored as well but it looks like we're going to cash in the snapcaster mage here it looks like it may be on blocking duty maybe a little double blocking taking place here yeah i would not be surprised to see a double block we have a three four five we can actually we can get an appropriate number of power in front of the elemental and that's what we're going to do So you're going to see a Township activation. Veril's going to get a little bit bigger, but it feels like to me Costa really wants that Elemental off the board so that if he does draw into a Renounce the Guilds, it's going to be a backbreaker. Costa going to get two for one here. Going to end up taking six points of damage, move down to nine, and draw his card for the turn, and Augur Vola, so that's a pretty good speed bump. Yeah, it's a, a great chump blocker, and again, like you said, another, another shot at finding Renounce the Guilds. He finds nothing. Yeah, it puts, also, a, puts a Thunder Maul to the bottom, too. Gives him breathing space. Costa still, if he can have enough time to set up a big revelation, might be able to dig out of this game still. 
So Nelson draws his card for the turn and a big one in Obsidak Ghost Council. Wow. Allows him to add to his board, not play into a sweeper, increase the clock. Wow, is that a big draw. So in comes Veros, in comes the Doom Traveler. And what you would normally see here, I think, is an activation of Gavney Township. And Brad says, no, I'm not activating that. So if you're Costa, there's a lump in your throat. And here's why. Because Obzadat is here to drain and gain. Because Costa is going to have to untap now. Did Brad remove it? Okay, he yeah. does. Puts a die on his deck, does not want to forget about that Obzadat trigger. Or does he? Okay. Draw a card. Oblivion Ring. Great draw. Now how does that affect things here for Costa? Oblivion Ring costs three mana. He can revelate for two. I don't know if that's going to do what he needs it to do. Yeah, he needs to find a blocker or some sort of answer for Obzadat and Verals. A challenging mixture. Yes, it really is. That Obzadat was one heck of a top deck there for Costa because he did he drew the answer to the card that was the problem in Verals. But Obzadat provides another problem now for Costa. And you see Costa looking at his resources a little bit frustrating knowing that he cannot win the game and he concedes the match. Brad Nelson wins two games to one and we'll be moving on to the semifinals to play against Reed Duke yet again. Junkers Aristocrats moving on. A great match of Magic, and you know, I think the post board games shift into blue, white, red favor there. But what is noteworthy is the cards that Costa picks up in the post board games, besides Renounce, which he didn't find, isn't Staticaster and. Fun